the evidence on whether media matters in shaping governance outcomes is clearly massive. Um, it dates back at least to the 18th century in Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, it runs through to uh, Amartya Sen and his arguments around development as freedom and why you don't get famine in a democracy with a free press. It runs through to things like the most recent evidence review by the Department for International Development on corruption, which found that the evidence available consistently indicates that freedom of the press can reduce corruption. Um, so I haven't actually tried to uh, encompass or summarize or find something that summarizes all of that evidence. I think it's largely accepted by most governance actors. Uh, and rather what I've done is to find something that looks at the impact of media development programs and particularly the impact of media development over the years and where the field of support to the media kind of comes from and the evidence supporting that. So that's evidence. The second uh, piece of reading I've suggested is looks at what is happening now, um, especially in relation to media in fragile states. And this is a report that I wrote a couple of years ago looking at the kind of media communication trends, principally looking at how those trends are shaping actual real-world governance outcomes, especially in fragile states. It's trying to track what's happening in the context of obviously extraordinarily fast-changing media and communication landscapes. A big part of that is obviously the increasingly ubiquitous access of digital technologies, especially mobile phones around the world, some of the fastest growth in, in, in new technologies is happening in fragile states. But it also looks more broadly at the media and communication landscape, including at the extremely rapid uh, changes and growth of more traditional media. Uh, in Afghanistan, for example, uh, the number of media organizations has been growing at something in a region of 20% since 2000, a year, since 2005. And alongside that, we are also seeing an increasing co-option of media as political actors, uh, other power interests in society are investing actually quite a lot of money and quite a lot of political will in making sure that they own or control or intimidate uh, the media so that the media cannot hold them to account uh, and so that they can advance their own agendas in society. And that's got really concerning uh, implications for media, but is also really concerning implications for governance. And finally on that, what it looks at is where the market forces are, if you like, in terms of shaping media, and particularly where uh, there doesn't seem to be a market model capable of supporting a media that enables conversation or dialogue across the fracture points in society, or divides in society. The third piece uh, which is taken from this uh, report, from uh, this notebook, from a guidance notebook from the OECD uh, Development Assistance Community Governance Network, which came out last week, which I'm afraid again is a, uh, a piece from uh, by me, um, which is really some guidance on how to approach thinking and design programs that are effective in supporting media to achieve governance outcomes. And one of the big challenges facing media support, pro, uh, uh, media support programs in a context of governance is often a lack of clarity about actually what the objective is. What is the governance objective that they're designed to achieve? Um, media is generally seen to be a good thing. It, doesn't, it isn't often very significantly prioritized in uh, governance support. But what this tries to do is to break down some of the objectives you might, uh, you might want to think about when designing a program. So is it, for example, designed to support democracy and human rights, to build an independent media sector as an intrinsic good in and of itself, um, essential to the functioning of a democratic society? Or is it about accountability, uh, to enhance accountability of governments to citizens, often in order to improve service delivery, state responsiveness, state citizen relationships? Is it focused on stability, improving state stability and social stability and conflict reduction to improve debate? dialogue, tolerance and fragile or conflict affect societies often in order to, um, uh, to increase the availability of balanced, reliable, trustworthy information, for example. 
would use for likelihood of hate speech or inflammatory language, particularly around elections. Um, and it suggests, for example, that uh, a really important thing to look at is how to build support to media within the context of electoral cycle approach, but also other um, uh, processes which are actually looking at the governance system, gov the governance problems within a particular country, political economy analysis, other governance diagnostics. Or is it around communication and development, actually trying to achieve some kind of behavior change or some kind of shift in social norms in society? The trouble with support to media is it can be everywhere and nowhere. And so unless it's located clearly within a clear strategy or a clear sense of actually what it is designed to achieve, what your support is designed to achieve, it can get quite problematic. I would say, having said that, that a lot of the trends we're tracking, and that comes back to the Fragile States piece, uh, is that media is in big trouble. Um, and often media requires support in and of itself, not just in order to achieve a set of objectives, but it, it, it is important to look at actually what um, the support is designed to achieve. So what I have done is to uh, cite the UNESCO Media Development Indicators framework, which is quite well respected uh, and has a really quite comprehensive list of the kind of indicators that might be used uh, to measure the impact of media support projects. And finally, the fifth report um, is a report from uh, the National Endowment for Democracy Center for International Media Assistance, which is a source of really tremendous reports and, and, and uh, uh, on the role of media in governance and development more broadly. Um, but this one looks at the politics of media development. Um, it's generally accepted, and I think one of the reasons governance actors find it so difficult to support uh, media as a component of government support strategies that such support tends to be messy, it can be difficult, it can be political. Um, clearly, there is an increasing acknowledgement that uh, support to government, support to development is itself messy, political and difficult. So I think there's an increasing interest that working simply at the state level um, and at an institutional level, at the state level, is probably insufficient in bringing about more sustained uh, improvements in governments, more sustainable political settlements, uh, that there is a need to work more at the societal level and because of that um, an increasing need to focus more on the role of media. But it can be complicated, it can be political and it can be messy. And so this final report, The Politics of Media Development, the importance of engaging government and civil society, provides some insights about how to do that. I think this is a growing area of governance. Um, uh, it's not one that has been well prioritized uh, within a lot of the uh, existing development frameworks. There's not much capacity often within the development system to provide really good guidance on this. And actually, when preparing this reading list, it was actually quite difficult to find uh, summaries, things which actually aggregated learning uh, across a piece. Um, it's something we're trying to do it in BBC Media Action, but it, it was actually not the great tremendous amounts of really good research and evidence outside of particular of the kind of organizations I've already mentioned. Um, so I wish you luck in your, um, in your support strategies. I think it's a key thing to uh, improve in the future um, uh, and to, to, to get right in the future, and I hope this is of some use in doing that.